lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Jeremy Lee in the building and every guest that you ever needed. Sports cards after hours keep the hobby heated. Updates, hobby talk like you never seen it. Sports cards live and nothing could ever beat it. Sports cards is a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Welcome to another episode of Sports Cards Live with your host, Jeremy Lee. Well, all right, everybody, I am back in the usual studio. Welcome to episode number 199 of Sports Cards Live. It is Saturday night, September the 23rd, 2023, and my name is Jeremy Lee. I would like to thank everybody who joined us last time with Gretzky Super Collector Brian Leffler. That was a great episode. You can check that out on the channel. Next Saturday on the show, our guest will be Mike Baker from Mike Baker Authenticated. He's the gentleman who puts the stickers of authenticity on other slabs. He will be on the show. We'll talk all about I Appeal and more. I'd like to ask you to join close to half a million people who have downloaded the Center Stage app across both iOS and Android for quick comps and cart management features. Their app is the fastest and most accurate at card shows or at home to help you price your cards, build, organize, share, and co your collection with friends and find other collectors to follow using the social sharing features. They have grading partnerships and marketplace features are coming soon. So check out their Instagram account and join me in supporting the great team they have and the innovation they are undertaking. Also, use protection, practice safe swaps. Veriswap is an app and middleman service that lets you securely trade cards through the mail. Every transaction up to a million in value is fully insured by their guarantee. To use Veriswap, you upload your inventory, make trade, partial trade, or cash offers, negotiate with thousands of traders already on the platform, check them out on iOS and Android, and they've launched their live show feature that lets dealers pre-list their inventory in the app. And when you're at a card show, you can search the floor for the items you want. As part of a special offer, your first trade on Veriswap is $1. There's a referral link in the video description for your convenience. I'd like to shout out Leighton Sheldon and Just Collect. He'll be joining us tonight for the Vintage Spotlight segment. And be sure to check out HobbyNewsDaily.com for your daily dose of hobby news and entertaining content. It's a collaboration of various content creators and original writers. And also Tag's Discord server is hopping, as is the Facebook group. You can join other hobbyists who value consistent, reproducible, and accurate, unbiased grading, who are chatting, buying, and selling, and networking, go to taggrading.com, the community tab, and you can join either community. You'll find out first about the tag grading drops, surprise flash drops, and other tag news. I'd like to shout out and thank Nick and Larry from the Sports Card Madness podcast for having me on yesterday. That episode on their podcast will drop in the next week or so. As always, thanks to all Sports Cards Live partners and sponsors, and to all you loyal viewers and listeners. And if you're not yet subscribed, please take a moment and do so. As always, your comments and questions are in play. Let's get to it. We're going to bring him out right away. No more blabbering by me. Let's bring him out. Dr. James Beckett. Welcome back, sir. Welcome back. It's been a long time, but welcome back to Sports Cards Live. How are you today? I'm doing great, Jeremy. But if this were my episode, it'd be about half over now. <laughs> <laughs> we're given ample coverage to some wonderful uh, companies that uh, you're working with. And uh, I actually had a nice long conversation with John Wee of Center Stage last week. And uh, I love what a lot of these uh, companies are doing in the industry. There's a lot of innovation and, and uh, you know, I don't want to be just a voice of the past. I want to be uh, up with what's going on right now. And it's pretty exciting what's going on these days. Well, let's jump right in uh, and talk about, let's talk about what you're doing because, you know, you, you've said you, I believe you're known to say you don't want to be, you don't want to be an influencer in the hobby. You want to somewhat influence the influencers, if that, if that makes sense. And if I didn't do it, if I didn't do that justice, can you explain kind of what your sentiment is when you say words that are, I probably messed up a little bit? Well, no, I mean, I basically, uh, it's not my desire. I, at one point, I had the probably one of the biggest megaphones uh, in the industry, you know, through the magazines. And, and, but that's not anymore. You know, I just have a podcast. That's my main social media thrust. And so I'm never going to have the platform and coverage that I used to have or that I even want to have because it really generated, I've said, you know, a thousand pieces of mail 
uh, you know, just every morning and every afternoon. So uh, I'm happy with what I'm doing. And so I look at guys like you and uh, other podcasters out there that are doing original content that I can, uh, you know, just either be a guest or uh, make some suggestions. And I'm, I don't even say I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you, but I probably am. On the other hand, there are things that you will bring up that I think, well, that's not the whole story. You're not wrong, but it's not the whole story because you weren't there in the, in the seventies, you started in 1980. So I've got a little bit of an edge on you. I'm a little bit older. And I'm not necessarily wiser, but I'm definitely older. And uh, I want to contribute that to it. But I also want to stay current. I will always defer to you as being wiser than me, uh, Jim. That, that, that to me is quite obvious. And, you know, you've, you've actually been really uh, kind to me over the last three and a half years. I mean, I reached out to you quite early in my, in my content journey. And you've uh, provided me with some mentorship, which I've greatly appreciated. And I've put, I've put to use, you know, I've really taken advantage of the time that I've had with you. Uh, it reminds me of just this past national when we were at the content creators gathering. Um, I forget the name of the hotel it was at, but there were probably a hundred different people there, whether they were content creators or or consumers of content. And um, I was going through a, a bit of an internal conflict with whether I was going to acquire some cards or not. And I brought it up with the, with the table, the people we were sitting with, you were at the table there, uh, Rich. Rich Klein was to your left, and we had Danny Black there, and John Newman, and some other some others as well. And um, you were giving me some advice, and you know, my question, the situation was there were some cards that were presented to me that I would love to buy, uh, but the person who presented them to me was an agent for the seller, and I wasn't sure if the price was fair and if I if there was too much money for me and all this. And and you gave me some advice. You had some suggestions. Uh, and I think that it was, you know, suggestions may be worthy of sharing with more than just me or more than just the people at that table. Do you recall what that was? And are you uh, willing and able to share that right now? Two things. One that we talked about that night and then one that I contacted you later that I, that I thought I should have said that too. Uh, the first thing is that anytime you're, there's a middle person in there, they have the chance to be a good cop, bad cop. You know, the, the middle, the interme intermediary could say, uh, you're going to have to pay this much. Uh, it's, if it was up to me, I'd, I'd cut you a deal, but it's not my card. And, uh, and you don't even know what's going on. You can't play poker with the person because that's not the owner of the card. And so you're at a disadvantage. So it just comes down to how bad do you want the card? And just like in poker, this guy's reading you to say, hey, he really wants these two cards because they are exceptional. And he's not going to see him, uh, you know, for a long time if he passes on this. So that was one thrust: is that it's always better to deal with somebody face to face, and then you could you could do part trade or you could you know kind of work the deal. The second thing was, and this is just what's happened for you recently, and has happened to some people and and me back in the day, is that you are now a hobby, not just an insider. You're making your living off the hobby. And so as such, your investment profile and the um, uh, diversity of your investments needs to be uh, taken into account. In other words, you can't be all in in the industry where you get your paycheck. And then also that's the sole source of your of your personal investments. You have to do things. I believe it's prudent to do things that are uncorrelated with your job. Uh, if you were in real estate then you wouldn't want to say, well, hey, I know a lot about real estate. All my investments are going to be real estate. Well, that's great, except that real estate does, is cyclical. Well, cards are cyclical too. And so I just thought if it's, um, you know, if it's, if it's uh, 10 or 15% of your investable assets, go for it. But if, you, you can do more than that if you're making a living in some other industry. Uh, but as we've seen, if you were uh, working for some, there's companies that have gone under, there's companies that have been, been major uh, disruptions. And so, uh, you know, and I think tag sounds like a great fit for you, uh, but you are making your living off the industry. And so your investment profile, I believe, should change. All right. But you're buying for your personal enjoyment and buying, you know, very uh, and kind of grail cards. So. 
They Go were great. It. You did. I did. I, I pulled the trigger. I, I, and then I went to another another group and uh, got uh, solicited for some additional advice and decided to pull the trigger. Uh, let's let's talk. Let's switch it up. Uh, first of all, I think that's great advice, you know, diversify. So, you know, hopefully everyone's kind of listening. Diver- I think I think it diversify more if you're working in the hobby. That, if you're not that. working in the hobby. You can be all in because you're you're a banker. You know, you have your banking job. Okay, let's let's do a quick. Now you spoke about this about it this morning. You're on you you guest uh, host on Hobby Hotline every so often, and um, I haven't had a chance to discuss this. I don't think live yet, but the Jefferson Burdick, the uh, the father of the hobby, I guess we could we could say the the person who who came out with the uh, what was it called the American the, the what's his book American Card Catalog. The American Card Catalog. He's the one that came up with all the the nomenclature for the the T two hundred six and et cetera. All the, all that name, all those naming conventions. And uh, he's been he passed away in the sixties. And um, fellow content creator John Newman from Sports Card Nation podcast visited his grave uh, gravesite, cleaned up his gravestone, which he said had been was just it, it had aged. It had some, you know, it just aged being out in the elements for several for decades. And um, I just thought that that was a wonderful initiative by him, and it'll help to bring more awareness to Jefferson Burdick and who he was. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on on that? And, and can you just give this audience uh, a quick synopsis of Jefferson Burdick? And you know, was he an inspiration to you? Because you know, to me, like you're you're in that same discussion as being a father of the hobby, uh, you know. So can you speak to Jefferson a little bit and what he meant to those of us uh, or more seasoned or, you know, mature hobbyists? Well, the most serious hobbyists that, uh, that collect uh, uh, diversely, uh, no doubt have run into American card catalog designations. Even the fact that Tito six is a set, it's actually not a set. It's many sets. But he was the one that grouped them and said, you know, we're just going to put all these together. They're, they're, they're white border tobacco cards from 1909 to 1911 or so. And so they're, they're way, lots of different backs. And instead of making them separate sets, he, he had some, which I tried to do as well, some level of expediency to say, this will make sense to collectors that are coming after me. So it wasn't just, hey, these are these and these are these and here's some letters and here's some numbers. He really put some thought into it. I tried to copy that, but uh, it was great to follow in the footsteps of somebody that was so well organized. And, uh, you know, it was his life work. It was his life work. He was completely dedicated to it. And that's probably one of the reasons I sold my company, because I was completely dedicated to it. And it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's very immersive. He, he was a single man. Uh, he had no heirs. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, his uh, his uh, grave was was probably not tended to. Yeah, yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but uh, it's nice that John Newman is assuming a caretaker that role. Is so awesome! That is so awesome. It's it. I, I was so touched by that, and uh, yeah, it, it's an amazing story uh, that John did that. Found the grave site, cleaned it up. He he actually went back the next day to clean it up after visiting it and seeing how how dirty it was. And then he also cleaned up his parents' gravestones. He was buried in the middle, and he cleaned up his parents as well. I, I, just such a wonderful hobby gesture, and um, I just thought wanted to bring more attention to it because I think it, I just think it's great. Now we only have you for an hour tonight, so I'm going to be rushing through, uh, unlike may, maybe more so than usual. Let's now talk about your content, Sports Card Insights Podcast. I remember the first time you were on the show was episode 30 with me. It's over three years ago now. This is episode 199 of my what I refer to now as like the flagship show, Sports Cards Live, the Saturday night interview show. And you at that point were at like maybe episode, I'm I'm kind of not exactly sure, two, two something, maybe 300 and something. Your goal back then was to get to a thousand episodes of your 15 minute podcast, Sports Card Insights. I think you're past a thousand now, Jim. Can you tell us? So you when you were when you were kind of re creeping up to a thousand. Now you've passed it. Where are you now? What is your current plan or strategy for the podcast uh, as you move past episode 1000? 
Well, I wouldn't say it was a goal. I, I thought it, it was kind of what I was implicitly agreeing to when I started. Uh, there's so the average podcast lasts seven episodes. You know, they come and they go. And so my brand promise for this Sports Card Insights uh, podcast was I was going to I was going to do a thousand. Now, I didn't say I would do more than a thousand, but I was basically saying I'm not going to do less than a thousand because I wanted to tell a lot of stories. I thought I'd be doing interviews, which I have. I thought I'd be dealing with topics, uh, past topics and current topics and future topics and all that. And as I got closer and closer to a thousand, I realized there's still more people to talk to, more issues, and there's stuff happening all the time. Not all of it is negative. There's uh, positive news as well. And I'm having fun with it. And uh, last Thanksgiving, I reduced my frequency. And I went to three times a week. And that really gave me a new lease on life. And I thought, you know, a thousand is in sight. I'm going to make that. But I'm going to enjoy it more if I do it a little bit less. And I've said this is this is probably it's not always the greatest full time hobby, but it's certainly the greatest part time hobby. And so I made it a little bit more of a part time thing and I'm enjoying it more. The problem is I'm just I get I get uh, I get too far ahead. I get I can't promise all these guests that I can get them on real quick. You may have the same problem because you're just doing once a week, but three times a week has really given me a new lease on life. So uh, if I get frustrated uh, maybe I'll decrease the frequency uh, uh, further. But I noticed Cage, you know, Cage Lawyer. He he was he got to a thousand episodes. What did he do? Well, he's restarted and he's three times a week as well. So he's not copying me because he's definitely his own man. But uh, you know that that's uh, uh, it was a good decision for me, and it probably was a good decision for Cage too. Yeah, yeah. Well. Congratulations on a thousand and thank you for your continued dedication to this hobby, considering you did sell the business uh, about 18 years ago now, if my math is correct. And, um, you know, you don't need to continue to to provide advice and insights for up for new hobbyists, uh, you know, veteran hobbyists and 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 the like. So, I mean, just thank you, Jim. I, it's it's awesome. I listen to it. I'm sure many people do. I know many people do. You probably know exactly how many people do. But it's it's. Uh, I just want to say thanks because your insights are invaluable. I, I believe that's my personal opinion. So, thank you. Well, I, I I'm going against type by not being focused because I'm a very focused person, and I'm intentionally giving myself permission to not be focused to do uh, non-linear episodes that are that don't necessarily follow one after another, uh, much like you do. I mean, whatever's coming up, you're going to, you're not doing uh, serial episodes where if you didn't listen last week, you're going to be lost, you know? So I'll have episodes about vintage type stuff. And then I'll, the next episode, I might open a new box of something that the vintage people could care less about. So it's, it doesn't, uh, so that's why I'm saying influencing the influencers because it's people, anybody should listen to the podcast, to all the podcasts, but to mine, especially if they have some interest in a broad base of knowledge about the industry, about where it's been, where it is and where it's going. There it is on the ticker, Sports Card Insights. You can listen to Dr. Beckett's podcast on Apple, Spotify, and probably some other platforms as well. We're going to shift out now and we're going to jump into talking about some of the concerns in the hobby right now before we do a couple of comments i got to get to some comments here but i'm not going to get to them all frank castello is first in here today good evening to you what a special treat your good friend rich klein says dr jim is still the smartest guy in the room and can't wait to hear what he has to say tonight mike truman good evening to you jake doll tch mike double v is in here looking forward to hearing what Dr. Beckett has to say, you don't care what I have to say tonight. You want to hear what Dr. Beckett has to say. Jeff McMahon, Hobby Champs, Mookie Chilson is here. Good to see you. Vintage card collector, Dr. Beckett's wisdom is unparalleled compared to any other content creator. A true treasure to listen to. Certainly, I, I let us agree with that. Well, first of all, to Rich Klein, here's my rejoinder there. Rich, you realize that I am in my room all by myself. So I'm always the smartest guy in the room when I'm in my own card cave room with nobody else there. So, but I'm in a zoom room with Jeremy and I'm, I'm jousting with Jeremy and we each have our specialties. 
Appreciate it. Chris C is here for the Yoda of the hobby. Chris C misses the days when Beckett price guide was what we went by. Brian Chu, I remember reading the Sport American Baseball Card Price Guide cover to cover. Stiff Arm Wax calls you the goat. Many people do refer to you as that. I see you. You see, you That's seem to get a little uncomfortable with that kind of. Well, no, it's, it's it's fine, but these are opinions, and and I appreciate them. But uh, you know, this we're supposed to have sports card content. <laughs> Let's create some content. Let's create some content. All right, let's let's do that. Let's jump right in right now and talk about some concerns in the hobby that you may have right now. And um, I'll, I might just open the floor to you and say, you know, I do have our the notes that I have for tonight. Uh, and I, I'll actually, I'll guide you here, uh, Jim. The first thing, black and white thinking was uh, maybe the, you know, the, 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 the topic that we can first speak to, but I'm going to put it over to you and say, when you, when you, th when you talk about black and white thinking, what are you thinking about when it comes to the hobby? Well, all or nothing, you know, and this is something, uh, some companies either all good or all bad, or a deal is, is uh, all good or all bad, or, or, or the uh, pricing structure is, is uh, good or bad. Um, I think there's a lot of things that are up for discussion. And if you really understand the hobby, you'll realize there's a lot of gray areas and black and white thinking is ignores the gray and just, you're going to be black and white thinking if you're going to follow the herd because they just say, Hey, here's, this is the way it is. And so by, by knowing, uh, by hearing a multitude of voices, it's going to be confusing at first because you're going to have uh, opposing viewpoints. And you're you're good to get those on and to create some honest debate. Uh, that's healthy. That's how kids learn. That's how hobbyists learn. That's how how you build your skill level by seeing that uh, that no matter who the player is, no matter how great the goat is, a card could be overpriced. It could be so fully priced that it's overpriced. And no matter how bad the guy is, a card could be underpriced because it's just it's it's still worth more you know supply and demand are are seemingly not uh, are, are ignored in the hobby for for periods of time but not forever eventually supply and demand comes back into equilibrium how about ba you know we talked about balance the other day and it's it seems like there's do you find in the content that you consume in the in the 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 topics of the content is there balance in our hobby right now there's a bit i'm i've i noticed we have lots of genres of content you know we have lots of different approaches to creating content you've got original content creators you've got the news reporters you've got the content about the content you've got the show and tells the breaking all sorts of different things out there is there any specific areas or genres within or niches within content that you think are unbalanced or could use more balance or a counterpoint? Um, any thoughts on that? Well, you just have to be discerning uh, listener or viewer. I mean, basically uh, all the successful podcasts and, and content creators are informing or educating and entertaining. And so there needs to be an entertainment element and an education element, but the insidious thing is that some of these content creators that are educating and entertaining are educating and entertaining with, with an edge <laughs> toward encouraging you to uh, do what they're recommending that in sometimes is good for them. And so you've got to be discerning to say, what what is this person's point of view? And if their point of view is to sell their own stuff or to promote something, then you just take that with a grain of salt. It's 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 buyer beware. In that sense, they're not purely a content creator that's unbiased. And that's okay. If you watch any of the news programs, the networks, they are all biased one way or another. And people have come to realize all of the networks, all of the cable networks, I won't mention them all, but it's pretty well known that they 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 lean one way. And if you just looked at the content creators the same way, then you'd think, well, that's that's uh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take that at, 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 as it's expressed, 
And I'm going to make sure I have some other opinions that allow me to have a ba balanced viewpoint. But if somebody's completely bullish or completely bearish, you really ought to be listening to both. Because not everything is going to go up and not everything's going to go down. When you are when you are a content creator and you have sponsors, both of us fall under in, into that uh, category. You know what? Like how how can we? How can it's different for you? I think you're you're Dr. James Beckett. You know, for for myself and other sponsored content creators, what should we be doing to ensure that we are not alienating our audience? We're not misleading our audience. We're not trying to. Uh, we're not allowing our biases to creep into the message, the, the education, the entertainment, the inspiration that we're trying to provide and deliver week after week or show after show. What, you know, how, because there the, the fact is, is that there are other content creators out there and there's been a, re, a very recent uh, fl flurry of this kind of uh, criticism, I would say, or observate let's not even say criticism observations perhaps that you know if a sponsored content creator can has to say what their what their sponsors tell them to say and i know that's not true at least for me but it might be for others i don't know but what are your thoughts on on that and you know should the audience be ad additionally on on uh on, on, just beware of the content creators that are sponsored. First of all, I, I make a distinction between sponsors and advertisers. So I have sponsors, not advertisers. So I'm not reading ads. Uh, actually, you can charge more if it's an ad because then you can say, and you're saying what they want to say. So I expressly wanted sponsors where what I'm saying is I trust these guys. I pick these guys. I'm going to stand with them. Uh, until such time as I find out that if they do something crummy, I'm going to say, well, I, I, you can't be my sponsor anymore. That hasn't happened because I think I chose chose wisely. Not that each of the entities has, uh, some of them had some ups and downs, but I'm, I'm implicitly endorsing them. And you are, whether it's sponsoring or advertising, you're saying, I think these are good guys. I think they're straight shooters. I like their products. I perhaps use their products. And so your so your reputation is aligned with theirs, and so it, not just them telling you what to do, you're telling them, say, look, you want to be my sponsor, you've got to take care of the customers, you've got to keep your nose clean. And so I I think you have power because you're the you're the you're the connection to the um, uh, to the public. You know when you're saying I believe in tag, that means something. I'm standing with tag. I think they're good guys. I think they have a great product. And, and that's what you're saying. Whether you say it that way or not, that's what it is. And so if they mess up, it damages your reputation. If one of my sponsors messes up, it's damaging my reputation. And so any of these content creators need to be very careful about who they're promoting or what they're promoting uh, because it's their reputation too. And people have long memories. It's funny you say people have long memories because one, you know, we often hear people say that the hobby has a short memory. We're willing to forgive uh, people's, you know, poor discretions and and indiscretions and and mistakes that they're making. We've recently all gone through. I say all because if you are, if you contain, if you if you consume any social media, any content in the hobby, you're aware of the whole card porn debacle and what happened there. And that is somebody that a lot of people seem to have trusted. And at the end of the day. Uh, we shouldn't, no one should have trusted card porn. I guess you didn't maybe know at that time, but, um, you know, that, that's, a. Well, I not, think not, not to speak to that specifically, but the best way to, uh, to do something it, it, again, th there's a lot of accusations. I'm not saying anybody's innocent or guilty, but if you do a lot of trustworthy, nice things for a long time, you, you build up trust. And so, and then you might, and, and, you know, sometimes people, once they have that trust, they can abuse that trust. And so just be careful if somebody is doing things, doing a lot of good things. It does, it doesn't always mean they're, they're pure as the driven snow. It might, might they, people are still, 
can have ulterior motives. I'm not judging in this case other than, you know, if somebody does something nice for me, I'm, I, it's not that I'm super suspicious. I'm just thinking, okay, well, that that's fine. But thank you very much. But that doesn't mean I'm going to immediately reciprocate, you know, in kind, because I don't know the person really. Did you ever have concerns about the anonymity of, of the card porn account of, of the human or humans behind that account? I had less concern because some people that I knew said that they knew who it was. And so, I mean, nobody's fully, nobody can be completely anonymous. And so, and, and they thought he was a good guy. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, uh, now, does that mean I don't trust those people anymore? No, I think they were duped as well. If if you believe, uh, you know what what uh, how the story is going now. Yeah, well, that and that was what I I was going to say, but I, I'm glad I'm glad you said it yourself and, and brought that up. Uh, okay, before we bring on Layton for the vintage spotlight, I wanted to get you to talk a bit also about what you refer to as the elasticity of premiums for the highest grades and the best players. Can you uh, can you explain it, that thought process to us, please? It relates to just what we were just talking about. Is that you know if a if a um, a jersey of a player is worth uh, fifty thousand dollars, but it can be worth five hundred thousand dollars if it's photo matched, and so apparently nobody figured out that you're not always photo matching the jersey to the photo. You're 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 matching the photo to the jersey you're doctoring the photo and so anytime there's that big of a differential between if it's photo matched or not photo matched you're you're going to have some incentive to somebody say, how can i creatively get a photo match here just the same similarly you know if something goes if something is uh, doctored up uh, uh, deceptively and undetectably uh, from a seven to a nine or even an eight in a in a in a vintage card it it can be a multiple a multiple okay so if it was if 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 a if a if a 10 a 10 card if a card in a 10 condition was a thousand bucks and a nine was 900 and an eight was 800 and a seven was 700 and so forth there wouldn't be the same incentive to try to goose something up a grade it just, it just wouldn't be worth it. But since the nine is worth a thousand and the 10 is worth 10,000, it encourages people. So I believe because of some of these uh, publicly, uh, what's happened publicly and been publicized is that those differentials will not be as stretched out. I think there'll be less of a, just like between threes and fours and fives in the vintage world. It's not multiples. They're, they're, it's incremental, such that looking at threes and fours and fives, they're all in the ballpark of a of a Mike Moynihan, who's trying to figure out regardless of the grade, which one do I like the best? But if those are seven, eights, and nines, the nine, regardless of how it looks, is is ten times what the seven is. And so I think those premiums will shrink over time. I think the, you know, when you, when somebody walks into your house and you say, I've got this Michael Jordan Jersey, they're going to say, that's really cool. They're maybe not going to care whether it's photo matched and they're never going to check it out, whether it was photo matched. They're going to say, that's a Mike, that's a Michael Jordan Jersey that's signed. that's uh, displayed nicely. You know, it's, uh, I think in the hobby, we're, we're, we're splitting hairs an 8.5 to a 9 to a 9.5 to a 10 huge differences in the value that the public maybe doesn't they understand that 10 or a black label is the finest the best you can get but you know if, if somebody walked in and saw my my 52 tops mantle which is not here it's at the bank uh i i think they would be impressed regardless of the grade because it's an iconic card but I don't have to have a 10. I don't have a 10. Uh, I don't have a nine. I don't have an eight. So uh, I, I just think there's there's so much marketing and promotion going toward having the best. There's nothing wrong with that. But the average person needs to figure out. I mean, 
how many people live in a house that's the nicest house in their in their city? Only one. Okay. And so the rest of people are they are they miserable? No, there's lots of nice houses out there that are on different blocks that have different uh, you know landscaping and different things that they might want and they just say, "Hey, this this is the eye appeal that that I'm comfortable with and I'm proud of my house. I enjoy my house." Uh, but I'm not upset that I don't have the nicest house in my city. And do you think populations are, are, are is the hobby then giving too much credence to po a low population, high grade card where, you know, I think about the Wayne Gretzky rookie as an example, you know, there's been thousands graded. There's two OPG PSA tens, only two out of thousands. There's several lines that look nicer than those tens. We we kind of understand that, but then well, you, if, a, you if, got, if a ten is three and a half million and a nine is one hundred and twenty thousand, do you see that gap closing? Absolutely, because like you said, see, and it's not widely known, but you were there and I was there, and the OP, OPG cuts and the, the the guillotine or whatever they're doing there, and, and even the controversy in grading. Uh, the you know sheet cut cards and and factory cut cards, um, yeah. It's I, I've no offense, Jeremy, but you know the the nine is 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 historically reasonable. The ten is off the charts, is an artifact of 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 our COVID experience, where things just shot through the roof because people were sitting home. And trying to figure out that if these things are going to the moon, I'm going to buy the finest. But as you said, the nines are arguably as good as the tens. And then you have other grading companies as well. So um, with different philosophies of how they're treating the cuts and the edges and things like that. So, um, but it's a shortcut to just say, I'm looking at the pop reports. There's only two tens. I got one of them and my hat's off to them. And they they paid what it took to get it. But some of these cards, I believe, when they go to sell them, whether it's in a few years, um, they may not go for as much. People may say, you know what, a, the 10 is is not going to come up and I don't I don't want to pay that much. It makes the nine look like a stupendous bargain. Instead okay. of thinking the nine is undervalued, people are, I think, likely to say the 10 is overvalued. And okay. when that happens, there'll be a shrinking of these premiums. And it'll, 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 it's not insane because I understand the mindset, but it's, it's, uh, it's two different hobbies, Jeremy. It's, there's a hobby for the really, really rich guys and there's a hobby for everybody else. Yeah. And I want the hobby for everybody else to be healthy. Well, you start off by saying no offense. I take no offense to any of that. I'm, I'm, uh, no, but you're knowledgeable. You're not typical. I mean, you, you, you can look at, the, you're not swayed. By the fact that just because it says it's a 10, it's the best one you could get. And not everybody is. Okay, let's run through some quick comments. Then we're going to bring Leighton on. Dan the Card Man says, always a pleasure to hear Dr. Beckett's thoughts. Junk Wax Kid, a special treat. Cool to see Dr. Beckett on the show. Always is. What's up? I collect Ichiro. Looking to hear forward to hearing from the Oracle himself. 90s hockey. Dan the Card Man in, re in relation to... To sponsor says transparency is key, which I think is uh, is is well said. John, we have center stage. Good evening to you as well. AIH Sports says it's concerning that the hobby elite got duped by a guy using the name porn. Uh, goes on to say a lot of people that Jeremy had on trusted that guy. I've had on about two hundred and seventy five people. I'm sure. I'm sure by it's a numbers game. Some will have maybe trusted him, but I've never known anyone personally who, who knew who that was. Uh, well, I, I guess I have just more recently versus uh, way back in time. Dan, the card man says people just need to get back to buying the card, not the label. That makes good sense to me as well. He says, sell the 10, buy the nine and have enough money left over to buy the nicest house in your city. Win, win for everybody. Abel in Vegas. Good evening to you. Tip of the mid is here. And Brendan Ryan, the old age debate between mint versus gem mint continues and likely will. Jim, before we bring on Layton, anything you'd like to respond to in those comments? No, I, lo I love the uh, you've got some you've got a great audience, Jeremy. And that's and not that you're not great, but your audience is great also. And that's 
it's an unbeatable combination. Keep Thank it up. Thank you. And hello to Jake from 90s Bebo. All right, let's bring on Layton. I have asked Layton to come with a question for you, and I've asked you to come with a question for Layton. So, Mr. Layton Sheldon, live from the Philly show, I believe. Is that right? How are you? Good. How are you, gentlemen? Hey, Layton. Doing well. Doing well. So, Listen, uh, Jim, I did say to you, you know, Layton's going to come on. You're aware that we do the Vintage Spotlight during Sports Card Live. Do you have something in mind to query uh, Layton with? Yes, I do. Uh, Layton, I was listening. To, I, it may have been in uh, one of your uh, discussions with Jeremy where you were talking about buying collections. I love buying. I bought, I, I actually can say tons of collections because it's, it's more than 2,000 pounds, way more, many 2,000 pounds over, over all those decades. But what I found is that one of the things you talked about is, is kind of making a deal and talking to the guy and then coming back the next morning. I have never done a deal that was more, that, that, that lasted that long. And so my question to you is, uh, when I was doing buying collections, time was of the essence. I had very little time to evaluate and either throw out an offer or, or better to get them to throw out what are they looking for, um, you know, on some of the buying trips I did at some shows, so estate sales, wherever I was buying a collection. Uh, I just I don't remember spending hours and hours or coming back later. You, you, you either did the deal. And so I had to very quickly analyze under a lot of pressure. Uh, and in those days, it was thousands of cards. Uh, so what do you do? What do you do to that? Because you're 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 a high volume buyer, and uh, and yet you're sensitive and you're you're you know you're enjoying the experience. But um, it's hard to buy collections, yes, and it's hard to buy them quickly. So what your what are your secrets? Sure. Um, well, first off, it's an honor to be here. Really appreciate being on the show. Um, you know, listen, respectfully times always change so they change day over day but then they change year over year and they change decade over decade so how what like when did you buy your first collection roughly 72. so we're talking about pre-internet decades yeah. ago so admittedly the process then might be a little bit different than today <laughs> a lot different exactly but, and again so the they point, didn't have price guides but but then you know it spanned forward and I've done now, but it, my point is just the time that it takes to either build a rapport or establish a value is, is tricky. Oh, listen, I always tell folks that what I do as far as being a professional baseball card treasure hunter is a balance of an art and a science. The science being the math, the art being a human being and talking to folks. And as you said, time is, is money. But I would say that I've also really appreciated the journey and the experience and i think that it comes across you know when i'm visiting folks whether it be their collectors or just a family who inherited something um but i wanted to get back to the point you brought up about starting the 70s so not only is it pre-internet but you're maybe doing a deal in 1972 or 1979 i'm making up a number for five thousand or for two thousand well today that number is twenty thousand fifty thousand five hundred thousand so you're asking about well, how can I take a time? How can I take the time? And how can I be so careful? Because right, time is money. Well, the difference is, is that in a few decades, the dollars are enormous. And I don't know about you, but I'm not born out of wealth. And so candidly, I would rather take my time, be transparent, evaluate the collection, know that even if I lose the deal, I've left my best on the field. Pardon, you know, that that proverbial cheesy sports pun. But I know, Dr. Beckett, that even if it takes me till the next morning, I'll know that I've left my best on the field. And I would say, for whatever it's worth, and I know this will sound cheesy as well, I have a very high batting average. And so what allows me to feel comfortable and confident when I go in there is I do a lot of legwork up front. And so really, that's my secret. You ask me, that's the secret to the audience is that, you know, I'm not a Pop-Tart. I don't just pop out of the toaster, and if someone tells me they have pre-war cards, I hit the road, Jack. No way. And to be fair, I might lose some deals, some collections, but I'll tell you what I won't lose is sleep because I want to make sure that when I hit the road, 
I'm giving myself and my company the best chance I can to evaluate and potentially buy that said collection. That's insightful, uh, Leighton, because I, I, I really hadn't thought about the different eras of buying collections, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the, the 2000s, the 2010s, and, 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 this, and this decade. It's evolved. And the, the amounts of money have, have continued to increase. The, the amount of knowledge has increased. Uh, I remember in the 70s doing buying trips, and you'd have a line out the door. Nothing, nothing accelerates the deal than saying, hey, guy, uh, I got five people waiting. <laughs> you know, here's the offer. Do you want it or not? Take it or leave it. And these other guys are standing behind him with lugging these boxes. So think about it. Just to interrupt for a second. They had nowhere else to go, Dr. Beckett. Yeah, yeah. There was no eBay. There's no consignment seller. There's no auction house, right? So if they didn't sell to you, forget about maybe the convention next weekend. They might have to wait a year or longer. Well, All I right, let's. <laughs> I got to jump in because we are on. We are in limited time with Dr. Beckett tonight. I want to now know, Leighton, did you have a question for Dr. Beckett? Anything you'd like to ask him tonight? I did, and I'm sure much of your audience, Jeremy, here tonight wants to know, as well as many others throughout the collecting hobby, is how did you get your start, not so much in collecting, but how did you take that passion, I'm sure, that you found, like many of us, we got the bug, and that's why we're still here all these years later. How did you parlay that into, wow, you know what, I, I really think the industry needs you know, guidance and insight and a price guide and all that good stuff. I'd, I'd love to hear it. I'm sure the audience would, would love to hear it as well. Well, I think, I think I'm more of a marathoner than a sprinter, you know, so I, I, I wasn't trying to, you know, be hasty and do things. I've always been, uh, I've welcomed a challenge and a big challenge and something that was, that you could put yourself into. And so, in the in the mid seventies, there as I was getting involved with, and I did everything. I had a card shop. I I promoted shows. I started a collectors club. I was a dealer. I was a collector. Um, I did all that stuff. But what really caught fire is when I could see that there were no price guides. There was no real cataloging that was that was helpful and meaningful and current. And so I thought I could do that, or I thought somebody could do. Somebody ought to do it, but. Nobody was going to, but people were saying you should do it. And so when I did it, it, it really became my life work. And, and unlike Jeff Burdick, I'm, I, I, I finished that and I, I'm not dying. I, I'm hopefully going to live for a while, but he gave his life to it. And I'm, uh, I, I gave a lot of my life to it as well, Sheldon, because it was uh, Leighton, because it was just not, uh, it just was a big, big, amazing thing to do. And I had great teammates and, uh, and I love all the sports. So it was a labor of love, but it surely was a labor. And so, and I had a skill set, you know, and, and I was in Dallas at the, for the latter part of it, we're at a great, you know, great source of talented employees. Although we hired from around the, around the, around the continent, actually. So I was very blessed to be in the right place at the right time. So thanks, Leighton. Okay, good stuff. Leighton, thank you for joining Vintage Spotlight. You can follow Leighton on Instagram, Leighton underscore, underscore Sheldon, just underscore collect. Listen to his podcast, Trading Card Therapy. Leighton, thank you for your continued uh, sponsorship, friendship, and uh, and content on the show. And uh, anything you want to uh, just say goodbye or anything you want to leave uh, the audience with before you go? No, listen, uh, Dr. Beckett, I know I'm speaking for many of us who are watching tonight and that are out in the hobby community. Uh, we're very appreciative and grateful for your efforts. And this is a lot of fun tonight. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Leighton. Thanks, Leighton. Gee, Jeremy, this is you're supposed to have sports card content here. <laughs> I appreciate the kudos, but, uh, you know, I'm, well, you're, you're, I'm out you're, of the line of fire now. I'm retired. Yeah. So I well, still want to be helpful, but uh, I appreciate the, the kind words. I'm going to go to a couple comments that have come in uh, over the past few minutes. Uh, Gone Collecting said, on sponsors, are we overthinking this? We don't worry that AT&T is picking Cowboys plays or Citibank is influencing the Mets lineup, even though their corporate names are all over each stadium. I think there's some uh, relevance to that for sure. Chris C says, a question for Dr. Beckett. Do you feel the hobby needs some kind of checks and balances because there's a lot of corruption happening 
are occurring. I'm not calling for regulation, but there are bad apples getting away with stuff. Can you respond to that? Well, people are innocent until proven guilty. And sometimes people are innocent for a long time. And then they do something that's guilty. You just got to keep your eyes open. And I, one of the things that can be bad is that the social media can turn into a mob with uh, insufficient data or jumped conclusions. But uh, if, if somebody does something wrong and it's, and it's bad, then they, they should not get away with it. And if it's bad enough that you ought to, they, they ought to go to jail. You know, jail time is a deterrent. You know, getting a slap on the wrist or paying a fine or giving it back. Uh, I, I want to see people that are, uh, these aren't just regulations. They're, they're criminals. Now, there's not many, but when they're criminals, they, they, they should go to jail. And people should not do business with them. You know, do business with people, not just that you like, but that you trust. Those, those ought to go hand in hand. Yeah. Okay. And again, the advantage to people who have been in the hobby for a long time, and yet I'm not, I, I can't deny that I've been fooled before. Um, but, you know, it's people, people are not perfect. I want to touch on two more topics here before we have to wrap up. The first one is uh, Panini and the, the issues that they are going through right now. And your thoughts on how the hobby is treating Panini on, on the public forums. I believe Panini has done over the last 10 years what Fanatics is aspiring to do. And that is, I think they 10 x basketball. I think they 10 x basketball. Now, for that, they're losing their license <laughs> and given to somebody else, and they're being called incompetent by the, the new incumbent, and they're being sued by a number of entities and, and accused of not knowing what they're doing or doing a bad job. And so I think they're getting a, a pretty, har pretty harsh treatment for something. They're looking like a small company that's getting beat up. They're a multi-billion dollar international company that's, but that's, that's had some setbacks. That's had some setbacks. And so it's, I've said, I just think it's amazing. Some of the Panini haters out there and there's upper deck haters and leaf haters and fanatics haters. But, you know, if I were running my company and I lost a bunch of employees who went to a competitor and I had a bunch of lawsuits, uh, it, it'd be tough to keep my eye on the ball. And so I, I, I just think you ought to cut Panini some slack. It doesn't do anybody any good for Panini to do poorly, you know, or Fanatics or Leaf or Upper Deck or anybody else. So uh, I, I didn't want to I didn't want to take market share from PSA. I wanted to increase our market share by expanding the market. You know, I, I don't want to steal customers. I want to create new customers. And if every company thought that, then uh, they, they would see that Panini's loss could be fanatics loss because people could lose uh, lose uh, confidence in the category or lose momentum. So I, I you know, I'm, I don't want to be Pollyannish, but, you know, being positive, th this is a very positive hobby. And that when we spend all this time about the negativity, it, it's a turnoff to new people. I think you've got to acknowledge it's there, but it's, it's a very small portion. When you say negativity, because there's a, there's a lot of commentary about just negativity versus positivity, but let's hone in on one negative sort of uh, uh, narrative, which is, you know, the sky is falling, the, the hobby is dead, no one's buying cards, the prices are going to zero, all, all this sort of stuff. What are your thoughts? I'll start off with a, mine briefly. When I hear that, I think this hobby's been around for 140 years. It's, it's, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. It's cyclical, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, but what do you feel and what do you think when you hear that narrative that the hobby, the sky is falling, the hobby is is dying? Uh, meanwhile, we have fanatics saying they want to 10x it uh, again after Panini already has. Uh, your thoughts on all that, please. It's black and white thinking like we talked about. And uh, the hobby will last longer than me. I will die before the hobby dies. Jeremy Lee, you will die before the hobby dies. Uh, the hobby's going to be around a long time. Now, now that doesn't mean prices are going to be continue to go up. They might, or they might bounce around. But there's uh, people love cards. 
the tangibility of cards, the collectability of cards. And so uh, to focus on the negative uh, in a black and white way that it's all going to go to zero, that's that's just not that's just not that's not what's going to happen. Uh, it's, like I said, most people, the, the hobby is going to outlive them. And so their cards are going to have value when they die and they're going to figure out, do I give them to my kids or, or sell them off or do something else? And whether they get more money or less money than they think right now, I, I can't say on that. But in the meantime, enjoy the hobby. Enjoy the hobby. Larry says right here, negativity feeds the social media algorithm beast. Okay, I'm watching the clock. I promised Dr. Beckett I'd have him out of here after one hour. That gives us about five more minutes. Uh, Victor, the rookie card specialist, your friend and mine, says, good evening, great show. I was wondering if the thumbnail is a new custom card of Dr. Beckett or just a creative work. I found it. I searched Dr. Beckett and found it. I don't know what it is, Victor, but um, let's move along. Anyway, it's a, it's a nice, it's, it was a nice image, so I used it. Mike Truman says, Dr. Beckett, towards the end of your run at the magazine, did you feel that the sheer number of cards was making the job of pricing difficult and impossible? Yeah, and that was 20 years ago. And now look at it. It's it really, I mean, there's not enough paper to print. I mean, we we really needed to go virtual. Uh, we were having to make so many tough decisions to do it. It became very difficult and frustrating for our excellent team. Uh, you know, we we just the price guy, it was it's like the almanacs. We couldn't even fit all the sets in the almanacs. So the sheer number of cards, it's it's not just the number of cards, it's the number of parallels, the number of unique skews, you know, and to, and to have a, a physical magazine or book price uh, on print on ink on paper was was very difficult. And then, but the other part of the question is just pricing it is difficult, even when you're even to have price reporting empirically of here are the sales records. You know, that would be simpler if all of the uh, cards that were sold had a common nomenclature, but they don't. If you go on eBay, cards are described any number of ways, and, and many of which are misleading and untrue, but it's still the card being sold. And in fact, if it's, if it's deceptively described, it may sell for more than it should. And if it's erroneously uh, described in a way that leaves out some important attribute. I mean, that's uh, the the guy's name is misspelled. It may sell for a lot less, and we had to deal with that. And it was that was increasingly problematic in the early two thousands, which was which was my exit. Okay. So, yes, very difficult. Last question. This is one that I find interesting. I think the whole audience will. It comes from Ray Hildreth. He says, "What do you think about fanatics wanting to take over the sports card market? And do you think it would be bad?" Or good if they try to buy a grading company. I think there would be bias on the grading company. Really, if you just uh, drill into this question, what are your thoughts on whether or not Fanatics acquires or starts up a grading company? Is there too much conflict of interest there, or can you see a way that that could work and the hobby would be okay with it? Well, first you get a near monopoly, <laughs> and then if people are going to complain, they're producing three out of the four major sports. <laughs> And so uh, we, we can say all we want, but they can do it. I think it's likely they will do it. And I do not believe that it's as much of a conflict of interest as, as, as people think. That some of the same logic was that, was that uh, we, you know, when we were doing the price guides, we couldn't do a grading because that would be a conflict. You're either going to have integrity or you're not. And, and if Fanatics gets into grading and if they do it with a lack of integrity, it damages their whole brand. So they have a lot to lose. Um, they have a lot to lose. So and and they're just like with with the card companies, there's going to be some others out there. They may not be as big, but they're going to be held to a standard. And if these if if Upper Deck keeps doing doing uh, nicely and leaf and Panini, and they have creative ways to compete, then Fanatics will be will be kept honest that way. And grading, uh, I doubt that they, I doubt that they would buy PSA. Uh, but if they don't buy PSA, PSA already has a huge lead, and and they are the they are the industry standard. 
Uh, would they buy tag? Would they buy somebody else? I don't know. But I'm not going to lose. Well, like we're saying, losing sleep. I'm not going to lose sleep over it because I, I have no control over it. And I think it's I think it's less of a conflict of interest than what people think. Hmm. People think if I were in charge, uh, if I'm Michael Rubin, I'd get all my cards to be graded as a 10. Well, Matt, Nat Turner doesn't have to worry about that. Who's thinking Nat Turner is is getting a, you know preferred grading for his PSA? A lot of his cards are in BGS holders now. He's he is crossing a bunch of them over, but but I, I don't think he, he's not saying, "Hey guys, I want all tens on mine." That's that's just that's that's damaging to the brand. And all of these smart guys that are running companies know that the brand is really important. And any perceived conflict of interest is hopefully. They would defeat that by going above and beyond to show transparency. And TAG would be able to do that. Because TAG can invite people to peek, peek in the window, like at the National. Yep. So it might happen, guys. And if it does, the sky will not be falling. And there you have it. Well, Dr. Beckett, I promised you I'd keep my eye on the clock. Okay. We're at, uh, we're, it's 10.01 your time, so I'm going to let you go. And say uh, thank you for coming on again. We'll get you back again and uh, do another one-hour session and uh, make sure that everything is is uh, is good at, good in the in, in the house there with uh, with your wife. I don't want to keep uh, I don't well, want to keep. I'm, I'm going to go from being the, the the smartest guy in the room to going to bed with my wife and being the second smartest person in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thanks as always. This is I think it's the sixth time you've been on, but the first time in about in a just while under, yeah. just not yeah it's been almost two years so uh we'll make it more frequent and thanks again for sharing your insights and your thoughts on everything and sure. um I, I'll, I'll let you go i'll let you just uh click on out but thank you so much thanks jeremy thanks everybody i'll uh, i'll be back again thanks all right Bye -bye. take care jim thank you oh well, i'm gonna let him pop off and uh we got lots of people in here still so I'm happy to run solo for a little while. If there is anything that anybody would like to chat about with myself, uh, I'm happy to do that. And if you all, if I watch the view count and you all start leaving, I'll drop off too. But uh, I'm going to go through some comments right now. And uh, I can't answer for Dr. Beckett. He's he's no longer in the building, everybody. But I can definitely uh, address some. Nikola Tesla wants to know, so when is TAG going to start accepting submissions? I've been accepting submissions for quite some time now. Uh, there's all access grading is available on the website, Nikola Tesla. You just have to go to taggrading.com and uh, look at what the options are. But um, that's already, that is already happening. Uh, Fowl Fieball says, Dr. Beckett always has something inter interesting to say about the hobby. It's always good. Mark Santucci, I, saw, I see you and I saw you and I saw a lot of the comments, everybody, but we only had an hour and um, Dr. Beckett has, uh, has lots of knowledge to share and I didn't want to cut them off too often, uh, more often than, than I had to. That's for sure. Jake's Toe, good to see you. Welcome back. Asks any new pickups, as does Jake Dahl. Any new pickups? Not a lot of pickups for me lately, everybody. Um, I did I did pick up a 2009 exquisite flashback RPA of Mario Lemieux. Picked that up a couple weeks ago on the PWCC Weekly, and it arrived like really quick. It's here. I, I have that in hand already. I put it up on my Instagram the other day and uh, love love that card. Outside of that, I, I got outbid on the card today. I bid $33 and I was outbid on it. So I didn't uh, didn't get that one. And if I just go look at my some of my purchases on eBay and PWCC, uh, nothing of, of any real significance. I've been picking up more set type cards for my cup base patch parallels and uh i picked this one up this one this one arrived already i don't you know i don't know how it goes for all of you but oftentimes we've got you know 12 packages coming in from various platforms i don't know if i, I have one and it's over it's been like it's been like six weeks, it's coming from somewhere in Europe and it still isn't here. But here's a card that I just picked up, uh, Guy Lapointe from 2005, the cup, the base patch parallel out of 10. I collect that set. If anybody has any, please let me know. Uh, I collect them from all years and I am definitely looking for more. So keep me in mind if you find any of those. I'd love to uh, love to pick it up. Brian Leffler, uh, 
Thank you, Brian. Love that card next to your. Oh, I just put, I just put all of uh, all of these up today because I received a package from I received a package from my friends at Stand Up Displays, and in the package uh, they sent me some PSA slab stands. So there was a package of eight, and I went through my PSA holders and I picked eight of my favorite Gretzky's and put them up just today. I forgot they were there. But that's what you're seeing, Brian. That's what you're seeing right there. Kinjo, Travis Konechny. Yeah, I saw someone uh, ask about Travis Konechny. He's a good player. He's a good player for sure. I definitely uh, think that. Gary wants to know, uh, good evening to me. I know you prefer tag grading, but what's your take on CSG? Would you buy cards graded by CSG? Thanks. So I think they're now just CGC. I think they have rebranded not too long ago, maybe, maybe back in July, I believe. They went to one brand for both their sports and, and their trading card game uh, product. And I'll tell you what, what I like about CGC, the sports division, is that when they started, they hired what I believe to be were two of the senior, most experienced, maybe the best graders from Beckett grading services. So I like that part of it. I like that I know who the graders are there. And I, I like their... Their slab, I think, amongst the four main human grading companies, I think I do like their slab the best. Uh, the label, I'm, I'm the label itself, the flip. I'm, uh, I don't, I don't love it, but I don't hate it either. I think it's better than the green one they put out. So I, I do, I do like it. I like it, and I wish them the best. I think they've got a, a, a good thing going there. Stukes has been hearing rumors of fanatics trying to buy large regional card shows. Can't speak to that at all. I appreciate your comment for Dr. Beckett. I collect Ichiro. Uh, no, Mike, I have the Sundin already. I have a copy of that. I will not. I know the one you're talking about. I have one already. So you're 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 good. I won't be competing for that one. Redemption says your top five all-time hockey. If you're talking players, Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, Bobby Orr, Gordy Howe. And I'm going to be controversial and just say Sidney Crosby. I know there's a lot of options there for sure, for sure. Mark Santucci, how much do you think a 1980 Tom Seaver goes for in a 10? Not a clue, Mark. Not a clue. Way too obscure for me. Thank you, Next Level Collecting. All right. Well, I'm, I am here relying on you guys in the chat for questions that I am able to answer. Uh, I appreciate Mark Santucci, your question, but uh, I just don't know what that would go for. Thousands, I would say thousands if it's a, it, it all comes down to population. When talking to Dr. Beckett earlier, and he was saying how he thinks the gap between nines and tens, for example, are going, the gap is going to shrink. I, I don't know that it, I don't know if it will shrink or not, but I do think that a lot of it has to do with the population. People love scarce items. People love scarce and rare items. The scarcer and rarer, the better. The scarcer and rarer, the more expensive they will go for, I believe. Larry says, no goalies in the top five. I mean, it, to me, it's a different conversation. It's almost a different game in a, in, in a way. But uh, Dominic Hasek is the best uh, technical goaltender. Uh, maybe not technical because he was, he was a little bit, uh, you know, untraditional in his ways. But uh, to me, he's the best goaltender of all time, just, you know, for performance-wise. Any thoughts on Connor Bedard's trading camp debut? All I know is that he scored a hat-trick in his first game, and uh, that's got to be encouraging for people who are stocking up on Connor Bedard cards and for Upper Deck and for, for LCSs and breakers who are going to be distributing that product amongst, uh, amongst the hobby for sure. Brian Leffler, thoughts on cup finals this year? Winner. I'm going to pick Dallas Stars. Listen, I think that team is good. I like that team. I know people are, are, are bullish on the Buffalo Sabres and the Ottawa Senators. I don't think they're going to be cup contenders, but I think they might uh, make the playoffs for the first time in a while, which would be pretty cool. But you've also got Tampa Bay. You've also got the Colorado Avalanche, the Edmonton Oilers. These are all really so The New York Rangers, all very solid teams. So we'll have to see. Gone collecting. What was your reaction to seeing the 2026 National Chicago AC Atlanta vote? As an aside, uh, yeah, I appreciate the transparent. I actually gone collecting. I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, that the National Communications team 
uh, shared the number of the votes, not just who won, not what just what city won, but the number of votes. I love that. I love that level of transparency. I, I, you can go back. I did not think that Atlantic City was going to get it. I thought it would be Chicago. And now we're going to have Chicago in 2025, 26, and 27 is my understanding. So three, we got Cleveland next year, and then three years in a row of Chicago, which I like because Chicago is the easiest to get to for me. And I just like the, I just like all the hotels nearby, the restaurants, the, the building itself is not my favorite. It's, I mean, unless they're going to improve the floor plan uh, in 2025, six and seven from what they had in 2023. Uh, but I mean, I can, you know, it's a trade-off. I think the tra- I think I think the pluses far outweigh the negatives for me. And I'm just glad that I don't have to uh, either decide not to go to Atlantic City again or that I just don't have to go to Atlantic City again because I was not, I was going to hope to not have to go there anyway. Jake Stowe, I don't know if Dr. Beckett has a, a PSA 7 Mickey Mantle from 1952 tops. I just do not know. Nikola Tesla, yeah, you are so lucky. Chicago Blackhawks fans, you guys got lucky. I think I think we're all, I think the hobby is lucky that Bedard ended up in an original six uh, city on a, you know, there's the original six NHL teams and Chicago is one of them. I love that. I think Chicago is probably the best destination for him in the, in the U.S., so, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Montreal Canadiens would have been really good for hockey and the hobby. I think it's maybe even better, though, that he ends up in the U.S. Uh, and that's, you know, as a Canadian saying that, I do like seeing that. Jake Dahl says, which NHL players have a breakout year in the hobby in the season? I'm going to leave that to the chat to answer. Professor, good evening, says, hypothetical. If the same card is a graded nine by all five companies, including TAG, should it have different pricing based on the slab it is in? Well, the answer, the to me, Professor, the logical answer is no. The card is the card. However, however, um, the hobby puts a lot of money into plastic and paper, a lot of money into the package it's in, that the card is in. And until that starts to change, which I think it will, uh, it's just going to take some time. And then I think we'll see more parity amongst uh, some of the grading companies. I think, I think. Mark Santucci, who is better, Hasek or Waugh, Hasek or Boudreau? I mean, I like Hasek the best, but all three are great goaltenders. I think you could be happy with any of them, uh, any of those for you. Yankees fan, any update on tag grading vintage as far as timeline? Not that I can provide Yankees fan, and simply because I don't know that there might be more than I'm aware of, but all I know is that uh, tag started grading back to 1989 at the National and I am not sure when Tag is planning to go back further. And as soon as I know something, I will start to, uh, you know, mention it here and there. Just like the good old days of After Hours, Junk Wax Kid. That's uh, th- that hobby content nostalgia right there, everybody. I appreciate that. We haven't done many episodes of that lately, but did one in the last uh, a few weeks ago. I think it was. Daniel A says Logan Cooley scored a beauty of a goal. Yeah, he was a third overall pick in 2022 by the Arizona Coyotes. I saw that highlight, and yeah, he danced around several players to uh, to score a goal. That was a beautiful goal. And Logan Cooley, uh, you know, that might be a name to to remember right now, everybody. If you are look, if you are already a hockey collector or you're considering uh, dipping your toes into the into the ice. Uh, Logan Cooley, Connor Bedard, uh, you know, Fantilli. There's several of these young players who will have to see what they do when they are playing amongst the men of the NHL. And one thing I'll warn everybody about, even Connor Bedard scoring that hat trick the other night in the exhibition game. The exhibition games in in the NHL aren't for the veterans. They don't really play too much. And I didn't see the lineups of who played in that game where he scored a hat trick. But go look at that. Go look at the lineups that night. And, you know, he might have been playing against minor leaguers, in which case it's not all that impressive. If the opposition's, you know, veterans were in the lineup, then it's more interesting. And then then it's maybe more telling. But even they're not going all out in these exhibition games. You know, they don't want to get hurt and all that sort of thing. So don't read, because I know this going back 35 years of doing hockey drafts. I would watch the stats in the exhibition games. And then I would draft early on according to what was happening in the exhibition. A player who had 15 points in the exhibition games maybe had you know one assist in the first three games in the, in the NHL and that got sent down. 
So be careful with how much stock you put into exhibition game performance. The real season doesn't start until October 7th or 8th, something like that. Larry wants to know who's the next Canadian team to win the cup. Well, I'd love to say my Calgary Flames. I think it'll either be the Toronto Maple Leafs or the Edmonton Oilers. I do not know. I do not know. Stukes, good to see you. What if Gretzky's unknown destination was Winnipeg instead of Edmonton? It was Winnipeg. Gretzky didn't. Gretzky went to Edmonton instead of Winnipeg because of a, a chess or a checkers game uh, determined where he ended up, and he ended up in Edmonton. Bounce back year for the Flames, asks Al G, my fellow uh, local collector and Flames fan. Are you excited about any of the young players starting their careers? I am. I think that Daryl Sutter chased away a couple of them. Uh, so the ones we have left, I'm 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 hopeful, and I think Huberto will have a bounce back year. And um, I'm I'm more excited for this season than I thought I would be, Al. And I think I, I hope you are too. Jameson, you're a big Hawks fan. What is the time timing for buying Berard? I'm sorry, Bedard. Well, first of all, he's not going to have any really important cards until like I, I believe February or March, maybe even April next year. So you got lots of time. You know, his young gun is slated to come out in series two, not series one. That's not going to come out until I don't know exactly when spring, let's say. So you've got time. It might, you know, usually the young guns, the best card comes out in November, right around the sport card expo in Toronto uh, for the number one draft pick overall. And, and there's still a lot of hope for that player. A lot, a lot, you know, there's a lot of potential built into the pricing. Now we'll have, we will have seen Bedard play, you know, seven months of the season, six or seven months before his first you know, his young gun comes out. So it's going to be a bit of a different year that way. But, you know, you think about a guy like Alexi Lafreniere, whose young gun came out in November and was selling for like $400 and he completely bombed and may bounce back eventually. Maybe this is his year. We'll see if he has a breakout year. I think he could I think there's potential, but yeah, it's going to be a different year this, uh, this time. Rich Klein, I think all of that transparency was evident when Joe, Jimmy, et cetera, spoke to you and the dealer board has a new president as well. And Rich is talking about the transparency on the vote for the location of the 2026 National. And when I had the new management team here on the show back in August. Uh, And Rich, thank you for being here as always. Do I have a top four defense after Orb? Ray Bork, Paul Coffey. I mean, how do you not say Nicholas Lidstrom? I'm a big fan of Zdeno Chera. Uh, yeah, pick pick from those. I mean, th- you know, then you got guys I didn't see play as much, like the Doug Harveys and the Eddie Shores. But you've got Larry Robinson. I mean, big bird. You know, he was he was a part of a dynasty. Um, Denny Pot fan. Speaking of defensemen that were part of dynasties, so and modern day, you got you got Chris Letang. You've got uh, Carlson. You've got the, some of the young guys now. I like Heiskanen in Dallas. You've got Fox. Um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It was a full lineup. It was the ha- the hat trick wasn't last night. It wasn't last night though, Daniel. That was a couple of days ago now. So I wonder what it was. Unless he had two hat tricks now in the preseason. And and if it was a full lineup, still don't read too much into it because these guys aren't putting. This isn't. Uh, you know, there's three different levels of hockey. There's the exhibition, which is le- level like zero. You got the regular season, which they certainly up their play and their effort. And then the playoffs is a whole new thing. It's a whole playoffs is the best hockey you will ever see. Rich says it's all around. So it's all around new management. And as such, they know the complaints and want to fix that going forward with, Oh, with respect to the, I think the, the layout of the national in Chicago. Uh, You're right. They're not going all out. That's for sure. Rich says, Dr. Jim only has BGS and BBG cards in his collection. Well, I don't blame him. His name are his name is on those slabs. If you had, if my name was on the slab, if there's ever a grading company called LEE, I mean, it's my name is a three letter. It's not an acronym, but it is three letters. I'd probably, I don't know that that'd be it though, because I, I do, I, I've got cards from from all uh, all great, not all, but several grading companies. Nick says the true test for Bedard is his first official NHL game. Yeah, his first several, right? Like let, let's let him get his feet wet. But remember, Austin Matthews, former number one pick, scored four goals in his first NHL game, and the hobby went wild. So if that happens again, I think uh, I think people will will be very happy. So here, Nicholas says Bedard's hat trick was all Bedard. He scored all three goals with his wicked shot, 
they would have gone in if it was a real NHL game. So there you have it. I mean, in accordance with Nikola Tesla's opinion, that that bodes well. That bodes well for Connor Bedard. Rich Klein says, let's see the person who founded BGS get his cards created by someone else. Fair enough. Could you imagine the negative uh, publicity? Definitely. Jake says, I have zero knowledge of hockey, but live in Seattle. Kraken land is Seattle. You guys made it into what, the second or third round of the playoffs last year? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And hopefully you become a, hopefully you're a, a Kraken fan. Kraken, Kraken, I think it's Kraken. Rich Klein says, I know the old world of hockey and harken back to the days of Tiger Williams and Dave the Hammer Schultz. Very good. April and Davis, Jeremy, are you familiar with Tops Now NHL stickers? I don't know really anything about them, uh, Abel. I don't have any any opinion on their collectability or their long-term value potential. I don't own one. I don't even know where to get them. Uh, well, I know Tops Now is from their website, so I guess I do know where to get them. But no, I'm sorry. I don't have any insights into those stickers. But a nice alternative to uh, cards, I suppose. Nicola, I've been listing cards on eBay recently, and breakers are destroying the value of ultra-modern cards. They break so much and then flood the market with good cards for cheap. Yeah, I, I've noticed that, and not just with breakers. I think there are, are other uh, platforms uh, that are that are contributing to what you're seeing, and and I agree that there's you know we've got this this major gap between the highest grade and the next grade. Say the tens to the nines or the you know, which wherever you want to you want to pick on on the grading scales, you also have this a, a very large gap between the best cards and the next best cards, and 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 you know you've got the the best cards and you got the cards that are pretty much worthless. Uh, I I always like to say you know I and I was just in back in Winnipeg where I'm originally from for the last like ten days, and I you know I'm I saw all my we were we were there on vacation visiting family and ended up a funeral, so I saw tons of my extended family and friends and um, several people were talking to me and said, Oh, will you look at my cards and can I show you this? And they even had two of my, two of my uncles showed me their box of cards. And I'm like, yeah, sorry guys. It's, it's just, it's, there's nothing there. So what I, I, I often say is, you know, people just won't even pay the price of shipping on this stuff. So that's how I, if, if no one's going to pay to ship, you know, you won't even pay to ship a card to you cards aren't worth much um a lot of them but that's and I, I think there's many things contributing to that situation daniel we need more to do more evenings like these thanks daniel i, I enjoy them too mark like the larry robinson answer gary says nice collection of gretzky pmgs in the background yeah there's my full rainbow of 2012 fleer retro pmgs there's a playmakers theater that's the intimidation nation that's an essential credentials and that's a 2008 jambalaya the first hockey jambalaya. Those are all hockey first, no, except the essential credentials, not the first one right there. But the rest are all hockey firsts. Stuke says, might be fun, but sacrilegious for a Minnesota North Stars fan being in the Dallas area for Stanley Cup finals. I mean, but then are you a Minnesota Wild fan? Lots of lo lots of levels to the whole Minnesota hockey situation. That's for sure. Abel in Vegas says, the ultimate best in hockey is the Stanley Cup final, game seven overtime, golden goal for the Cup. Yeah, no doubt. That I agree with you there, Abel. Mike Truman, I put Crosby as number five. Where do I put Yager? I mean, Yager's, I don't know where I put Yager. I mean, I love Yager. I love the guy. I, I, I love watching him play. I love his attitude. I mean, I, I'm more comfortable saying, here's my top 20 favorite hockey players. But when you ask me to now rank those 20, I find it a lot, a lot more difficult. I'll put Gretzky number one every single time. And then after that, really after that, you can you could go Bobby Orr, you could go Gordy Howe, you could go Mario Lemieux, you might go Connor McDavid. So I, I'm I'm not really willing to go into you know that level of of uh, if I had to I would, but take too long. It would just it would just take too long for sure. Daniel said I missed the portion where Dr. Becker was on. I'll go back and watch. I was wondering if he gave you his opinion on the current state of the market and where he sees it going in the future. We did touch on. We did touch on it. It was more in the context of the sky is falling narrative. The hobby is dead. No one's buying cards. I saw somewhere, I was watching some content today. I think I saw, it might have been, might have been uh, Dustin, the sports card dad, did an impromptu live today. And maybe a, co uh, a commenter in his chat said, 
no one's buying cards anymore or right now. And I'm like, really? Like where are like, not obviously I, I just like a mind blowing, ignorant, uninformed comment. And uh, cause people are buying cards. I mean, we see it all the time. So, um, but we spoke about it kind of in that, in that context, Daniel. Nikolai broke a bunch of ultra modern cards recently and pulled some pretty scarce good cards and they're worth nothing close to what they should be. So I'm tossing this stuff off to the side. Yeah, I always wonder what to do with uh, with cards like that. You know, they're not worthy of, you know, the 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 showcase real estate at a card show, at least at my booth when I usually do a six six showcases. I'm not putting, you know, dollar cards in the showcase. I often I I rarely do like the dollar boxes. So I often don't know what to do with them, but yeah, there's that's a that's a challenge for sure. Rich Klein, thank you so much for joining. As always, good to see you, my friend. Abel says, is there a multi-sport card that you enjoy that includes a hockey player? Nothing comes to mind right away. I'm sorry, Abel. Nothing comes to mind. Ladies, man, love to interview. Don't know what that's in relation to. Sorry, sorry. Nicola specializes in rare Yager inserts and parallels from the 90s. Ah, oh, that's a great. I'd love to love to see that collection. Sounds amazing. Also says, the hobby is never dead, at least to true collectors. And that's the thing. The hobby might feel... I don't want to say dead because it's certainly it's 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 so it's 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 more alive than ever actually. Um, oh, the inner I see, I got it, ladies, man. The Jagger interview, yes, thank you. I, I love doing that too. That was a ton of fun. But you know, at the end of the day, all these cards that we see selling, and I'm not people say this. If you consume content, you've seen other people say this. These cards need a home. They need a, a final collector to want to hold that card for an extended period of time, like whatever that is, a couple years plus, let's say, five years plus, whatever, 25, 40 years. And cards that get flipped and flipped and flipped and flipped and just move from, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm saying the word flipper uh, in with any negative connotation because I think flip, the, the truth, the pure flipper does provide a service to our hobby by moving cards from, you know, one, one market, one, uh, one region to another, they're helping cards get to those collectors. But in the, in the interim, they're flipping from flipper to flipper to flipper. And many of these cards are, and then you see them come up on, on auction over and over again. And that's just increased supply, even though it's maybe not all at once, but it is increase in supply, which is going to drive down the demand. And that's going to drive down the prices. And that's what we're seeing. So we had a, there was a comment the other day um, on Thursday, actually two nights ago when myself and Adam Gray and Karn were doing the PWCC premier auction show and someone, the comment was made that the auction was a little bit weaker than we had seen. And the, the conclusion was that's kind of a good thing. It's a good thing. It might mean that some of these cards might, might mean, might mean that some of these cards have found their way into people's collections who want to hold them for an extended period of time instead of just buying them to flip them in the next month's auction. And so, you know, the weaker the auctions get from a selection perspective, I think that's a good thing. That's I think that's a better thing for the hobby. It means more people are not willing to sell their cards, maybe because they are the collector or maybe because they don't feel that the market is in a place right now that they want to sell it. Maybe the, the values are too low. And they're not happy with that. So they want to, they think, well, I'm not going to sell now. I'm going to wait for the cycle to go in the other direction. But the hobby is far from dead. Far from dead. Hobby Champ says Jagger is better than Ovechkin, even with the goal record. I mean, I, I'd want to, I'd want to die, do a deep dive into that to, to say for sure. But, you know, these are both world class, all time greats. And I, I don't even like feel like we like I understand the sentiment. People love to say who's better than that. Use that greater than symbol there in the middle of, of Jagger and Ovi. At the end of the day, can't we just like all these players? Can't we? Why do we? And I I, I don't mean this really, but you know, why do we always have to rank and, and decide who's better than who? And you know, is 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 it is Jordan or LeBron or who's the GOAT there? Is it Crosby or Ovechkin? Is it Gretzky or Lemieux or how or or, or who is it? Like, these are all great players in their own eras. I prefer to enjoy the the memory of all these players playing that I saw play and collecting all of them, not having to say who's 
the best. The one thing I will say is that Gretzky is the best of all time. Junk Wax Kid, look up the 92 pinnacle Tom Glavin. He's in the rink with a hockey stick. He was drafted by the Kings as well as the Braves. True story, was aware of that. Junk Wax Museum says Eric Lindros could have been great. I mean, he was great. He's a Hall of Famer. He was great, but he could have been greater. He could have had a much greater resume if he stayed healthy and concussions didn't become uh, a real detriment to his career. I agree with that, Junk Wax Museum. Mike Truman says, I understand a dollar card not worth shipping, but what are we saying when it comes to moderns? Like, a, is a $40 young gun getting tossed to the side? Well, it shouldn't be. 40 bucks is 40 bucks. So I wouldn't, I'm not tossing $40 young guns to the side, but I'm, I kind of, I kind of feel like I know what I would do with those cards if I had them. Those would come to my, to card shows with me and as a set up as a vendor and they'd make it to the booth with me. I don't know that they're getting, uh, real estate in my showcases, but they're definitely coming with me and they're probably not coming home with me. I'm either going to uh, consign them to a consignment seller or yeah, that's what I'll end up doing with them because I don't want to deal with them otherwise if they're not going to make it into my personal collection, but I, I have them because I acquired them in a collection or I cracked a box and they were in there. Tom Brady was drafted by the Montreal Expos. Yep. Lindros was great when he played. Injuries derailed his career for sure. Hockey Barn says Jagger is the GOAT player, I believe. They all have their value, says Nick Hutton. I think he's talking to all cards. And that, listen, what I do with what I do with commons is I package them up in team bags of 10 and give them away on Halloween. And I I don't get enough kids in my neighborhood to give them all away. So every year I, I add more to the stockpile of these little, these little bundles. But then I give them to to kids at my at my kids' schools who like them. We have, my daughter has a friend in his class who has an older brother who loves hockey cards. And I gave the kid a like, it was I, like a four row box. I filled the two middle rows with, with like, I even threw in a couple autographs and jersey cards and, I, and the big four row box. And I gave that to the kid. And then the mother reached out and was so grateful and just, you know, they love it. Like that's just a, a nice... A nice thing to do and you know maybe it's a way to build the hobby at a grassroots level so i encourage things like that you know hospital donations school donations church synagogue donations um all those sorts of things if they will take them look into those halloween's a great one i've been doing that for 15 years now if not longer tip the mitt says like dogging on guys at the end of their career just appreciate the opportunity to continue to watch them yeah that's that's easy that's the that's the most pleasurable way to take in the sport for me is just enjoy the sport. I don't need to worry what player is better than the other, unless I'm trading cards or I'm in a fantasy pool and I'm making a trade that involves those players. I'm going to then consider who I want on my team. Hobby champs. I understand it doesn't really matter who's better, but he's still a better player with a better career. Fair enough. Nikola Tesla. Zegras young gun is only like $35 supply and demand. I mean, they produce a ton of them. Listen, young guns to me, uh, I don't collect them. I've lost interest in young guns personally. Um, I think I think they're they're a great entry level card, you know, unless you're talking about the top echelon of players where they're in the thousands. But most young guns raw you can get for you know well under a hundred dollars. Several you can get well under twenty dollars. So I think that young guns uh, are, are are they definitely serve a purpose. It's the the every man's card, if you will, and. Um, and the fact that Zegers is only 35, again, supply and demand. That's where, that's where it's at. And maybe Zegers will have a better year and they will go up in value. I don't know what they'll do with Konechny in uh, in Philadelphia, Kinjo. Don't know. Abel says, does Brady deserve the Gretzky treatment regarding fast track to the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I think he does. I think he does. When, when anybody is, you know, has way more Super Bowls than anybody else, and when anybody is considered truly the greatest of all time i think there an exception could be made personally that's how i would vote but i wouldn't uh induce anyone else to vote the way i did mike truman says egress is valued much lower than i thought i assumed it was because the supply is tremendous i think that's i think that's it i do think that's it all sports for halloween or just hockey really whatever i have if it, if they're i keep a box kind of down you can see the this box right how do i right there I got three boxes under that one here. Let me take the comment off for a second. So you can see I've got kind of three boxes there. One has used but very clean top loaders. 
One has some personal collection stuff that is just like, you know, super low end. And the other one are my base cards uh, that and just like stuff to give away. And sometimes there is non-hockey in there for sure. Currency Project says Gretzky is number one, Lemieux is 1B, and then there's about a dozen guys tied at number three. Yeah, I mean, I I don't disagree with that, but, you know, I could be swayed as well. I could be swayed. Nicholas says, I remember when Matthew's Young Gun was just released back in 2016, and that card went for 200 right off the bat, but as Egress is 35, Caulfield 50, what gives, right? Supply and demand. That's it. Nothing more than supply and demand. Seriously. Nothing more. I mean, the other thing, Zegers plays for the Anaheim Ducks. Not a, not a, not a, listen, I was just at the Anaheim, the Burbank show in Anaheim. There was very little hockey there, less than I was expecting. Uh, Southern California just is not a hockey hotbed. So the fact that that's where Zegers played, if he played in Edmonton with Connor McDavid, or if he played in Toronto, or he played in Calgary, or Vancouver, or Ottawa, or Winnipeg, or, or an original six town, if he played for, for the Detroit Red Wings, the Boston Bruins, the Chicago Blackhawks, the New York Rangers. Um, I could see the Colorado Avalanche even, you know, this, the teams that get a lot of hobby love, I could see them selling for a lot more. There's many factors at play. Jamison Riley says, Yager wasn't even the best on the Penguins. Well, he had Mary Lemieux there most of the time. So I think that would be true for sure. Mike Truman says, that said, Ryan Getzlaff and Corey Perry, fellow Ducks, have had outstanding careers, much scarcer sets. Yeah, because they're yesterday's news, Mike. They are yesterday's news. But I remember quite clearly in 2006, seven, both those players were extremely hot. Like there's lessons to be learned from this, from this, everybody. There are lessons to be learned when you consider guys like Getzlaff and Corey Perry and Zach Parise and Thomas Vanek. I mean, their cards sell for peanuts now. And they were the hot players back when they were, when they were rookies or in their early, early years. Daniel says there was way more hype with the Matthews rookie first overall pick and he plays for the Leafs. Exactly. Exactly. Nicola doesn't collect. I sell cards. I generally stick to vintage hockey and baseball, but a break once in a while is always fun. The supply is tremendous because the breakers are flooding the market. If the breakers didn't break, then the cards would come to market in moderation. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if the breakers didn't break, like that's the hobby. So we can sit here and complain, and I'm not saying this at you, Nicola, but the, the, that sort of sentiment, I think, is kind of silly. It's just, it's just, it doesn't make sense to, to, con- to think that way. Okay, fine. That's the reality. Now let's adapt and make it work for us in any way that we can. Make it work for you as a collector. Make it work for you as a dealer, a flipper, an LCS owner, whatever. Don't just, comp- and I'm not saying it you, Nicola Tesla, but don't complain about it adapt make it work for you be creative don't be in don't just complain about it all the time and again that isn't directed to you nikola tesla hobby champ says the cool thing about modern young guns is that they are the players only flagship rookie card but there's just so many of them printed are they even short printed anymore no no they are they're not short printed anymore i mean sure they are short printed relative to the base cards that i give away on halloween but they are not short printed relative to most other cards out there. Kinjo says, I will always support the hockey market and buy young guns. Awesome. Nick Hutton, the hockey does not get credit. Mookie Chilson, Jeremy, what was your headline from the Burbank show? Good show, busy. Yeah, it was good. Ice, it was on two floors, you know, card dealers upstairs, corporate and a few dealers downstairs. I spent most of my time downstairs at the tag booth. But I did go upstairs a few times. Like I, I looked in all the showcases. I saw most of the booths. Um, it was a comfortable show. It was a the, it was good energy. It was nice and bright. I really liked it from that perspective. Um, not enough hockey for me, but there was some. I picked up some hockey cards there. Uh, picked up a, picked up a nice baseball card there as well. So I like I liked it. Uh, I think they do need to tweak a few things for next time they have it at that venue. And I think they realize that. And I think they will improve as time goes on. It was their first time in that building. And if they go back to that building, I have to imagine that they will want to improve. If you are not continuously trying to improve whatever it is you're doing in life or, or elsewhere, um, what are you even doing? Willie T. Brady definitely deserves a fast track into the Hall of Fame. How LaFleur and Lemieux all went to the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame while still playing. Well, that's because they came back out of retirement, though, Willie. They came out of retirement. 
and they got the fast track in though, but then they came back in after. Hobby Champ says, I'm buying so much hockey lately, literally pennies on the dollar for amazing cards of comparable players and other sports. Feels like crazy good opportunity that is stupid to pass up. I like that. Nikola Tesla, believe it or not, here in Chicago, hockey cards, the hobby in general, isn't really that big, despite the fact we host the national. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been to the I've been to probably 10 nationals in Chicago by now. And hockey is scarcer there than soccer is. And um, you guys have a team there, an original six team with Stanley Cups. We'll see what happens with Connor Bedard. I mean, the Taves Kane era, there was more car, there were more cards in the late 2000s at the Chicago National than there have been recently because Kane and Taves were two of the hottest players in, in the hobby and the league. They've, you know, they're not that anymore. But now that you have Connor Bedard coming, we'll see what happens. We'll know the three years in a row of the National in Chicago, I think will be very telling. And I'm looking forward to them, to seeing how the hockey, how, how hockey cards are performing, how well they're represented. What does Upper Deck do with those shows to, to flex the Connor Bedard muscle? Abel says, I know there was some upset vendors in the downstairs area as all the action was happening in the upstairs. Hopefully Burbank can find space where everyone is on the same floor. Yeah, that'd be great. Professor says, can you also point to your Jeffrey Griffiths Gretzky cards book? Yeah, I have his book uh, up there somewhere. Um, it came in two versions. There was a numbered version, I think to 99 would make sense. And then there was an unnumbered version. I do think that these are out of publication and you'd have to... Uh, to find a copy on the second. I'll grab mine just to show you guys what, what we're talking about here. So this is the book Gretzky cards by Jeffrey Griffith, who is now Dr. Jeffrey Griffith. And uh, there's the back cover. There's the spine right there. Not much to see there, but um, if you just kind of open it up, I'll just kind of flip through it for y'all. It, it is pictures sto- like just talking about all the cards from his, his you know, first year, it's by manufacturer, I believe, but it goes into some serious detail. And then there's like a complete checklist of his cards up until the checklist goes up to, oh, it's not in, looks like 2008. It looks, well, that's, he's got all the, the checklist isn't comprehensive. It's almost by manufacturer, it seems like. So the first check, okay, no, it's not, it's not. There's manufacturer there's the main checklist there's cameo cards maybe there's food issues but this checklist goes up to oh, i'm into the cameos yeah 2007 8 season is where it ends but there's the book and it, it's pretty cool i've known jeffrey for 15 years see him at all the shows really nice guy i've we've done several deals i've, I've acquired many of his hand-me-downs uh he was doing the the, the hall of fame psa set registry uh Hockey Hall of Fame. I was doing that too at one time, and um, I would get his hand me downs as he was upgrading, which was uh, always it's always nice to know where you're getting your cards from, and I always like getting Jeffrey's cards. Mark says I agree. Southern California and Florida aren't hockey hotbeds. Uh, they're not Montreal, Buffalo, Chicago, Detroit, etc. For sure, for sure. What is the one card you wish you bought at the show? There was a beautiful. I don't know the year. Is it 50? What year is the Pee Wee Reese Bowman color? Uh, there was one of those. It was it was in a PSA 4 holder. It had a PWCC I appeal sticker on it. And I just, just, I didn't pull the trigger. I went back on the last day. And of course it was sold because it was a beautiful, beautiful copy for sure. Nikola Tesla, I'm not complaining. It was an observation. I know. And that's why I kept iterating that I wasn't uh, saying it at you. I have plenty of cards, high-end stuff I can sell. And I like, like I pointed out, I deal in vintage, good stuff. The baseball card that I bought at the Burbank show was a 2007, I think it was 2007 Upper Deck Premier Collection, Cal Ripken Jr. patch card numbered out of 75 with like a nice four-color patch, beautiful picture, beautiful aesthetic, uh, beautiful card. Let me let me just pull up a picture from my... From my uh, database where i keep pictures of all my cards so i just go into my baseball folder and scroll to 2007 and it should be right here there it is this is the card i bought two patches both are three color numbered out of 75 just a i just saw the card and it was like 
it was 60 bucks. I was like, 60 bucks. I'll buy that. I love that. I'll buy that for $60 all day long, all day long. Chris C says, still have my 79 tops hockey sealed. May get the packs authenticated. Yeah. If you're going to sell it, get them authenticated. I wouldn't bother when you have something like that. Personally, I don't see the need to authenticate them unless you're going to sell them or you want to use them in their, in their slabs uh, or display them in their slabs somehow and make a nice display out, out of it. Then I certainly would. I've got an unopened pack collection of Opeachy hockey and some other not, other non hockey as well, and they're all slabbed. And um, the 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 plan is to eventually put them up in uh, like on a wall on display. Did Clapper was elected to the Hall of Fame the day he retired? That's a Hall of Famer from the Boston Bruins rookie cards in the 1933 sets. Nikola Tesla actually vintage football is worth nothing. It's crazy. You just got a really nice vintage football collection. I'm shocked how little they go for compared to vintage baseball and hockey. Colin Murray, I'm set up at the Philly show and I'm the only one with hockey. No love for hockey, so undervalued, still no buyers. This makes the Toronto Expo the best show around for hockey for sure. I mean, I I, I, I really believe that hockey has the second most solid foundation of collectors, which I think bodes well for the future of hockey cards, second only to baseball. I think basketball, I think the basketball hobby is has been largely dominated by the flipper community and i think a lot of that ha i think that has something to do with some of the value appreciation we've seen there a bit of maybe a bit to do with it and i don't know that that how, how many true uh, listen i'm friends with several hardcore pure basketball collectors and i respect them as collectors a ton and you know who you are but I don't know that, that that community is super huge right now relative or compared to the hockey, you know, super uh, committed collecting community and for sure baseball, which I think would, would just dwarf all others. Hobby Champ says the Ovechkin rookie, sorry, record chase over the next two seasons is going to be a bright spot for the sport of hockey. Going to bring in some eyes. Yeah, hopefully, it, hopefully, I say hopefully it does. Because I just mean hopefully the chase continues and he does chip away at it week after week. Uh, in the next couple of seasons, what? Uh, oh, cool book! Yes, the, it's a it is a pretty cool book. Jake Dahl, I've been trying to find that Gretzky book. No luck so far. Hey, if we get enough people asking for it, maybe Jeffrey will put out a new volume. Uh, you know, an an updated version of it, and uh, wouldn't that be pretty cool? That would be cool because he stopped it away. But I also think he stopped being a master Gretzky collector after that season, after that year of cards. So. He could update it, but I don't know that he would update it with cards that, that, that go from, you know, that, that add on from 08 to current. I don't know that he would even find that interesting right now. Yeah, I think it's 53, the Bowman color, guys. Thanks, Jake. Thank you, Mark. I thought that's what it was, but I wasn't I wasn't certain. Mike Truman, I do find it amusing how modern Gretzky in an Euler uniform is generally more desirable than Gretzky in a Kings uniform. I wonder if we all have psychological scars from the junk wax era. I think it's that that's where he won his cups and that's where he had most of his success. And I think that's what it comes. I think that's the really the, the sole reason, Mike, I uh, personally, I prefer my Gretzky cards to have him in Edmonton. That's where I remember him best in Edmonton. I saw him live playing for the Oilers. I don't know how many times as a kid in the eighties going to games in Winnipeg, we were in the same division, but I probably saw him play twice a year for eight or nine years in a row sort of thing. I've probably seen Gretzky live like, 15 to 20 times and most of them would have been in the 80s like from really probably from like 82 right up until 88 so what is that so six or seven years i probably saw him play i'll say i'll be conservative probably saw him play play 10 to 12 times Ooh, the bowman Wee color is a 53 card with a 1946 photo yeah it, it's a it is such a such a sweet card one of the most aesthetically pleasing cards out there not my favorite aesthetic not my favorite baseball card from a, from an aesthetics perspective for me like yeah, i say it all the time 50 it's a 53 card for me as well but it's a 53 tops willie mays is my favorite looking vintage card and i've never owned one i don't own one now i've never owned one but i would like to own one one day yeah cal was such a, a good guy to watch play i liked watching cal rookin play as well followed his career and uh yeah just just a, a wonderful player for sure I thought it was a good deal at 60 bucks, junk wax. I really did. Chris C agrees, vintage football undervalued. Nicola, I started collecting hockey when I was a kid back in the 80s, and I've been 
hooked ever since. I did take a hiatus in the late 90s, but hockey collectors are passionate about the sport. Yeah, that's pretty much my my timeline as well. Oh, no, sorry. I was in the early 80s. I started like in basically in late 70s, early 80s. The Currency Project says, given the amount of superstars currently and soon to be active in the NHL, what would Jeremy Lee do if he stepped into the Batman position for a season to help promote hockey in the U.S.? Listen, I, I was going to say I'm not a marketer to the Currency Project, but I'm I'm in the marketing business now with what I'm doing with auction companies and doing live streams covering auctions now. So I maybe I am in, I am in marketing now. So I'll stick to what I know. I would do I would I would hire me to do a live stream. How's that Currency Project? No, I don't know what I would do. I would try to get the I would I would elevate the the profile of the May of Ovechkin and Crosby and McDavid and Matthews. And I'd probably try to identify one like star player in each market uh, who has a personality. And I would try to come up with some sort of, I don't know, like, you know how the mayors of two cities place bets for the Super Bowl or the Stanley cup or whatever. I would try to get some sort of uh, maybe get the players to do a, a draft and do a show about that. Or I don't know. I'm sure I'm thinking too small here, but I would really try to market the stars better than they ever have. And I would do it in the U S I Canada does not need marketing. Like, yeah, we get it for the Tim, you know, Sidney Crosby, and Nathan McKinnon are on the Tim Hortons commercials every year. It feels like I, I would rather do it with Dunkin' Donuts, right? Do it in the States where, where I'd rather see hockey grow. Hockey does not need to grow in Canada. It's, it's grown. It, it doesn't need any help. So I would focus on the U S uh, and I would try to, but I don't know how. I mean, listen, Gretzky went to LA. That helped a lot. Now we have so many teams down in Southern US. But if these teams can't sell out, if they're not filling the stands, I don't know what I would do. I'm I'm uh, I'm very new uh, to the to, in the world of marketing. Let's say, Junk Wax Kid, he'd love to have a copy of that book. I love having it myself. Daniel says, I agree with regards to the hockey collector market. You have a whole country that focuses on hockey. I'm exaggerating, but you know what I mean? I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Hockey is, again, I think it's probably the second most in North America. Listen, we know that basketball is huge in Asia, for sure. Soccer, I don't really understand the soccer market. I don't follow it. I don't, doesn't. It interests me as a hobbyist, but it, the the subject matter doesn't. I mean, would I like to own a Ronaldo and a Messi card? Sure, sure. Only because I know about them. You know, I'm not a soccer fan. I don't watch the sport. Uh, but you know, I want I want to own cards of them like I want to own a Charizard, right? Just because it's kind of uh, a sign of the times in a way. But I I, I I can't speak much about it. But yeah, I think that uh, baseball and hockey have the strongest foundations in the hobby baseball of course number one nikola i prefer gretzky and oilers jersey but that's because i like old school cards fair hobby champs off topic but my first hockey pc was owen nolan number one overall draft pick in 1990 89 or 90 nolan that started in 91 i used to love that early 90s nordiques team yeah i mean yeah you, yeah i get that i get that joe sakic uh, was there as well valerie kamensky there were some great players there Nikola Tesla, not only that, but the Kings the Kings jersey Gretzky played in was hideous, okay? The Nordiques were amazing. Peter Stasny, yeah, Mich I don't know, Michelle Goulet. Back in the 80s, two of my favorite players were Michelle Goulet and Denny Savard. Those guys were, they were art, art on ice. Those two players were two of the most fun players to watch play. Yeah, Goulet and Savard, two of my all-time, two of my favorites from the 80s. Tip of the mid says, which Gretzky rookie has more value raw? Tops or Opeachy? That's Opeachy. It's just, it's just Opeachy, uh, tip of the mitt. Mike Truman says, that Nordiques team had three consecutive number one picks. Doubt we'll ever see that again. I miss the Nordiques, yeah. Although Oilers had several in the several number one picks in the last 20 years. Hobby Champ says, you ever hear the story about Kevin Costner? <laughs> no, didn't hear that. <laughs> didn't hear that. House of Jordan, welcome to the show, says, there's only one true goat, and you all know it's Michael Jordan, 23. Well, he's listen. I'm going to give you that. I, I I believe that Michael Jordan is the goat of all goats. That now, and I, I like to say that there's more than one goat. 
even though greatest of all time implies that there can only be one greatest, we use the term loosely, and goats travel in herds. So I'm willing to uh, to, to to use it loosely, more loosely than you know, uh, technically we should. And I believe that the I believe that the the most goatish of all goats by sport are Michael Jordan and Wayne Gretzky. I think they are the two biggest goat of goats. You know, you could say Babe Ruth, but there's challenges to him like Mickey Mantle um, and maybe a couple of others. But, you know, they're in the discussion as well. Football, it's probably Tom Brady, but, you know, he wasn't instrumental in a couple of those Super Bowls. So maybe lesser, less so there. But I think if you put all the goats in a room, I think Michael Jordan, I believe, I, I, I questioning this now because Gretzky is Gretzky. Like, I don't know. I'm going to put them together, House of Jordan. I'm going to put them together and say that Gretzky and Jordan are the goat of all goats. For me. For me. Daniel A says, NHL needs more personalities. Need more Ronix, Chelios, and Marshawns. We have we have uh, Matthew Kachuk down in Florida now. He's, he's in that kind of group and a great personality and just tells it like it is. Big fan of big fan of his currency project says, How does pack grading work? I watched someone open a graded 1086 Fleer at the Burbank show, and each card was 6040. Is the grade on the yeah, it's on the external, it's on the pack itself. It is not on the cards inside. They don't open, they don't know that those cards are off center when they grade the pack. It is on the pack itself. Is it are there holes in the corner? I have a couple sevens. And there's like holes in the pack itself at the corner where the gum might have, the core sharp corner of the gum might have like, you know, poked a hole in it. So there it, it it's it 100% is on the pack, not the cards inside. And I can also tell you that the way they do packs or the way they used to, I don't know if they still do it now at PSA was first the pack would go to Steve Hart, a baseball card exchange, and he would authenticate the pack itself as for not being tampered with but he wouldn't grade it. All he did was authenticate it. And then PSA would actually apply the grade once they had the blessing from Steve Hart. Now, I don't know if that's still what they do, but that's what it was. When I was building my collection, uh, that's what was happening. Stuke says, Kirill Kaprizov is on fire in Minnesota, but could be more marketed better. Yeah. Players can always be marketed better. I mean, he was on fire early. His cards have come down in value quite a bit, but the season's right around the corner here. And I was noticing just uh, earlier today when I was looking at the selection of cards in tomorrow night's PWCC hockey auction that the cappers off PSA 10 in there was at like $230 before buyer's premium. That's the most. That's already the most we will have seen one sell for in weeks of doing the show. We see one every week when myself and Josh Madigan of the Hockey Guards Gong Show do the Sunday night weekly PWCC hockey show here on sports cards live Nick Hutton. So how do you get an agreement between Duncan and Timmy's? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Jake doll would be awesome. If McDonald's did a hockey card set like Tim Hortons does. I can't see both doing it though. It was McDonald's for many years and now Tim Hortons has the deal. So can't see them giving it to more than one of those uh, restaurant companies. Mike Truman, Goulet and Savard. You love the stashes. Yeah. Well, Lanny McDonald, Dave Babich, yeah. But no, it's not about the stashes, Mike. Those guys were just great to watch, but good good comment. Professor says, in my research on the Gretzky Cards book, I found a nice write-up on the PSA website about Jeffrey and his books. Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey Griffith has been honored at the PSA luncheon several times for having top sets. He's got an amazing collection. Uh, it's all hockey, uh, and... Um, he takes it very seriously, almost like professional. He's almost a, prof a professional collector, I would say. Will Bennett, good to see you. Says Peter Stasny never gets the credit or hobby love he deserves. And little known fact, Peter Stasny was the second highest point getter of the 80s behind only Wayne Gretzky. Now, Mary Lemieux didn't start playing till 85, 86. So that's part of the reason Peter Stasny played almost the whole decade. So he was able to get a lot of points over all the years. Nikola Tesla says, yeah, Goulet was fantastic with the Hawks. Then one game he went flying down the wing, lost an edge, went to the boards, head first, and that was it. Yeah, I remember. I certainly remember him better with the Quebec Nordiques. Junk Wax Museum, the city of Colorado, reaped some serious benefits, I feel, for Quebec. Yeah, they went and won the cup the next year, right? After, after the team went from, moved from Quebec to Colorado, and then 
Patrick Waugh basically flipped the flipped the bird to the Montreal Canadiens and went to play for the Colorado Avalanche, and they won the Stanley Cup. External condition, yes. Jack Nicholas is the goat of all goats, says Colin Murray. I was thinking about Tiger Woods when it comes to golf. I mean, Tiger Woods is up there too. And I think that's the reason why for me, Colin, I don't, cons- I don't, I'm not with you on that, but I also understand it. Like Jack Nicholas, you know, he's, he's hard to argue it, but I think Tiger Woods gives you an argument there. Abel says for hockey to continue to grow in the U S they need more TV games and the Stanley cup should be nationally televised just like basketball, football and basketball is on all the networks. Yeah, that would definitely help as well. Abel, of course, of course it would. Trust me. It's the golden bear says Colin Murray. Can't trust you on. I can't trust you on something that is, that is subjective. I just can't, I can't take the words. Trust me, Colin, but I also am not like, disagreeing with you i just i see an argument for a couple of ways there junk wax mcdonald's and upper deck did the nba back in the 90s nicola says as a blackhawks fan i'm a big time rona collector and it's great because his cards are more than affordable yeah so i was talking earlier about the card that i didn't win today on ebay i put in a bid and was outbid that was a rona card today nicola tesla that i got outbid on maybe you won it was a, it was a sp game you supreme patch Numbered out of 12. Really cool Flyers card, actually. But maybe you're a Blackhawks fan, so you didn't, you weren't bidding on that one. Chris E says, Babe Ruth over Jordan. Sorry, and I hate the Yankees. That's the thing about these con- that's why that's why these conversations are I just don't love them because everyone has their own opinion. And um, I don't even care to argue about them or debate or debate them. Like I just don't care enough. They're all good. They're all good. Stuke says best hockey name was Lucien Deblois. I remember Lucien Deblois. I played for the played for the Jets. I saw him play many times uh, live. Mario Marowa, another one who played for the Winnipeg Jets back in the early 80s. Yeah, Mario Marowa. That's a great name, too. Jack Nicholas also had 19 runner-ups in the majors. That's like the LeBron James, you know, the long, the, the argument for why LeBron James isn't the GOAT, because he's lost more finals than he's won, sort of thing. And I don't know that. He's lost more than he's won there for Jack. Chris, he says, Ruth changed the game and brought baseball to the forefront out of the dead ball era. Oh, just like Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. So Magic Johnson is the GOAT. Just kidding, Chris. Just kidding. Chris says, Ruth changed the game. Oh, same comment right there. We have a huge recency bias when it comes to the GOAT conversation. We always have a huge recency bias. Will Bennett, I knew, I noticed that was your auction, actually, Will. I, I knew that was your auction. And at the end, I wanted to, I tried to put in another bid, but I ran out of time. I tried to put it in, I promise, but wasn't able to. Call Murray, say, the stats say Jack. Listen, I don't care as much about stats, personally. I'm not arguing against Jack, but stats, to me, don't tell the whole story. They just don't. They tell part of the story. They tell part of the story, and an important part of the story, but to me, Stats are not the only thing to look at when deciding who the GOAT is. I think there's more to it than just that, personally. All right, guys. I'm at the bottom of the comments. We are over two hours now, so that's a full episode of Sports Cards Live. Mike Truman says, no one loses a Stanley Cup championship like the Boston Bruins. The Flyers have it in them, but they need to get there more. Stuke says, Trent Tucker, Michael Jordan's teammate this morning on the radio, said Magic Johnson was the best player ever. I mean, Trent Tucker, a professional basketball player, I'll always take someone, I'll always take the opinion of a professional athlete over someone, a card collector. You know what I mean? Like those people, that's why in the NHL, the Hart Trophy is awarded to the most valuable player, but it's voted on by by uh, by the press. Whereas, the what's the trophy called the goal is it the Lindsay trophy or the trophy there's another trophy that gets awarded to the player voted the best by the other players to me that trophy is underrated that's the one that should be getting all the love not the heart trophy heart trophy is cool but the 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 is it the Lindsay what what trophy is it guys that, that is voted on by the players and awarded every year to the most valuable player whatever that trophy is and the fact, that, yeah, thank you, Mike Double V, the Ted Lindsay Trophy. That's the one that should matter way more than the Hart Trophy that is voted on 
by the press. The press. The press, you guys. Talk about bias. The freaking press votes on the most valuable player. Right? It's not the GMs. It's the press. Even the GMs I don't like that much. So I like the Lindsay Trophy, you guys. Go look up who's won the Ted Lindsay Trophy every year. That's Those are players... And I'd like, I, you know, it's going to be a lot of Gretzky. It's going to be a lot of Lemieux. Well, maybe not Lemieux. He was often playing with Gretzky. But go look at that. Go look at that uh, trophy. Daniel says, I read a stat that Nolan Ryan never won a Cy Young. That blew, Yeah, I read that too recently or saw that recently myself. Watch the Nolan Ryan uh, movie on Netflix or wherever I saw that. Loved it, by the way. Nolan Ryan is like, what a great, uh, what a great athlete. Yeah, he was he was something else for sure. Seven no hitters, right? I mean, do you have to win a Cy Young to be amongst the greatest ever? Or can you have just not won one and still be? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But Nolan Ryan, one of the best of all time, in my opinion. I also, you know, remember Greg Maddox and Randy Johnson. I mean, these are all-time pitchers, all-timers. And then the ones from, you know, earlier than that, I'm not as familiar with. But definitely... Some great pitchers uh, all along the way. Babe Ruth was a pitcher. All right. Again, I'm at the end of the comments. So I'm going to, we're going to end this, everybody. We're going to end this. Thank you for joining. Thank you to Dr. Beckett for coming on with us for an hour. Thank you to Leighton Sheldon for jumping on for the Vintage Spotlight segment. And I want to echo and, and just, you know, actually emphasize what Dr. Beckett's saying about said about the sports cards live audience. He said that, you know, we have, we have an amazing audience here and uh, just want to let you guys know, I'm always grateful and thankful for all the comments, even the ones that I, I don't agree with. Like it doesn't matter. Agreement. Agreement is not required. I think Rob Gerard sports card therapist sort of coined that term here in the, in, in content. Agreement is not required. No, it wasn't him. I think it was Brent wire. I think it was a deep value investor, Mr. Pareto, Brent Wire, might have been the one who started that. Anyway, one of these guys started saying that, and I agree with that comment. We don't have to agree. We just need to respect each other and have the conversation. That's it. McDavid already has four Ted Lindsay awards. Yeah, he probably has four heart trophies too. But I'll, again, more value in the, in the Lindsay than the heart for sure. Thank you, Stukes. Thank you, Junk Wax Kid, for being here. Daniel, good night to you. We'll see you in November. Eric Stefano, good to see you, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Mark. Great second half show, five out of five. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. All right, guys, we're going to end it right now. Thank you for being here. Almost right now. Thank you, Chris C. The writers were dumb in 73 especially. What happened? What happened in 73, Chris C.? What happened? Before I sign off, what happened? Who they? Who did they give it to? Thank you, Nick Hatton. Thank you, Next Level Collecting. You take care too, Nicola. Good, great comments tonight. Thank you for taking part. All right, Chrissy, I'm gonna shut this off. Oh, there. Well, yeah, you're welcome. But if you're gonna, if you can answer what they what they did in 1973 that was wrong, I'd love to hear it. I'm gonna end this now. Your comment, your comment will still come through even after I end this live. Everybody, thanks so much. We'll be back tomorrow with Josh Madigan of the of the Gong Show for the. For the PWCC Hockey Weekly, Monday night, MC Mondays, the Focus Auction, $1,000 items. We'll be covering those ending live on eBay. And next week, next Saturday on the show, our guest is Mike Baker of, of Mike Baker Authenticated, NBA. Those little those little, little gold, silver, and maybe black stickers that he puts on grading company slabs to indicate I, I appeal uh, quality. So he'll be on. We're going to talk all about that. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I know I've been, I, I know I've been trying to wrap this up for like five, ten minutes already, but this is the this is the final one. This episode of Sports Cards Live is now over. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of.